Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Jones, and I'd like to welcome you to the most recent Sustainable Buildings Canada uh, webinar. Um, the topic today is laneway ADU, that's uh, accessory dwelling units, and tiny home residences. Uh, these are becoming a significant um, uh, wave in, in um, housing development, and so we really wanted to uh, sort of dive down into this and figure out uh, what are the challenges that people are facing uh, with these uh, this building type? It's a very different, um, yet very similar to a lot of the things that are, have been being built in the past. Um, and how can these uh, address both affordability in housing and just uh, accessibility of housing, the availability of housing stock? Uh, so we brought together a great team today um, to give you an overview of case studies in two different places in sort of the GTA and out uh, by London and St. Thomas. Um, here's an overview um, of, of the agenda today. So here we are right now at one o'clock. Um, my name is Adam Jones, as I said, welcoming you here. Um, and Natalie Armstrong from uh, the Enbridge Savings by Design Affordable Housing Program is uh, going to take over from me in a moment and um, introduce those of you who have not heard of this program to the program and remind you of the program if you have heard of it before. Um, then we're going to go over to Dave Peterson and Kent Foster from City STEM, and they're going to give us uh, a presentation on some of the challenges that they have faced um, in the greater Toronto <laughs> Hamilton area um, with laneway houses. Um, following that, uh, we're going to have a presentation from Yoko Oikawa and Stephanie Coleman on their project with Doug Terry Homes, uh, the St. Thomas Tiny Homes. Uh, and then following that, we're going to get everybody together with um, Brody Paul of C uh, City of Hamilton and Natalie Armstrong from Enbridge um, to have a panel discussion and hopefully take a lot of questions from the audience. We have a lot of questions for them um, ready to go, but uh, we're hoping that uh, this the presentations develop some questions from you. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who sent me questions in advance. Um, we are always happy to hear uh, in advance. It gives us some time to think about what you uh, are interested in hearing about. Um, one quick note about the, the <clears throat> format of the Q&A before we get there. If you have any questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to just um, send it in. There's a little question um, uh, button that you can hit and you can just type your question in. That'll come to me and then I'll ask it of our presenters um, at the appropriate time. And then during the Q&A, what you can do during the panel discussion is you can just hit the hand raise button and then I will call on you, ask you to open your mic. Um, and then you can ask the question directly, or you can type it in and I will ask it for you. Um, a few things coming up uh, from Sustainable Buildings Canada. We have another webinar next month. It's going to be a product knowledge webinar. So we don't have the details nailed down. I can tell you one um, technology that we're going to be featuring is uh, a drone-based system for measuring um, the thermal uh, transmittance of the building. Um, and then we are just nailing down the second one. So uh, look forward for more details on that and feel free to register there and then you'll get updates as they come. Secondly, we have finally launched uh, the topic for this year's Green Building Festival. Um, the the um, theme this year is positive. Uh, so we are, we are pr bringing to you a, a full day of programming about how the built environment can contribute to positive outcomes in ways that um, we can take this idea of positivity and move it into uh, the notion of sustainability. Usually what we're looking at is the negative uh, problems related with the built environment. So we're trying to spin that around. So um, you, there are a few links here. You can go to gbf22.com or you can go to sbcanada.org for more information. Um, and we're doing that uh, online and in person in Toronto um, on November 1st. So please register for that as soon as you can. With that, I'm going to invite Natalie Armstrong from Enbridge to give us an overview of affordable housing and introduce our presenters. Natalie? Thanks, Adam. So um, it's nice to be here today. As Adam mentioned, I'm with Enbridge Gas and I'm on the energy conservation team there. My focus is specifically our affordable housing clients and helping them with their new construction projects. Um, since tiny homes are a form of affordable housing, SPC was kind enough to let me have a couple minutes to talk to you today about what we do and hope that it's something that you would like to find out more about. So what do we do? So at Enbridge, we offer a high performance building program, uh, which is delivered by our friends at Sustainable Buildings Canada. 
And what we do is during the design development stage of a project, we bring uh, the project team in for a free day of building science and sustainability consulting uh, with the idea of helping you um, identify uh, energy conservation measures to incorporate into the final specs of your project. Then once the building is built, it uh, enables you to be able to access incentives of up to $120,000 when you build beyond the Ontario Building Code. Um, we are looking for projects that are in the design development stage. They can either be part nine or part three, as long as they are classified as affordable housing or have an affordable housing component to them. So what that means is um, a minimum of 30% of the units have to be classified as affordable. So uh, no more than 80% of median market rate rent. Um, our typical participants are of course, social housing providers, but also uh, transitional housing, um, uh, shelters, and of course, even private developers. Uh, in order to uh, be eligible, uh, the participant has to have received some kind of government funding towards the creation of affordable housing. So that could be for a previous project that you've done in the past or for the, for the project, the current project. Um, some examples of funding, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but some of the most popular ones are uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing, Investment in Affordable Housing, um, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Sustainable Affordable Housing, any kind of provincial funding, and of course, municipal funding. So for example, the City of Toronto has a program called uh, Open Doors. So something like that would automatically make you eligible. Um, as well, uh, because the program is delivered by Enbridge Gas, uh, the pro project has to be located in our delivery area. So what that means is GTA, Niagara, Barrie, Durham, Peterborough, and Ottawa. Uh, so basically, uh, if you have any projects that, you, that are on your radar and you're interested in finding out more about, please feel free to reach out. My contact info is there on the screen. So my phone number and email and uh, our program website. We would love to hear more about what you're working on and see if we can help you. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so my apologies, everyone. I was notified halfway through that, that the, the my screen share was not working. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so let me just step back two seconds before we have Natalie introduced. This is, here's the, the GBF info. Um, so there you go. There's the, the the logo for this year, the the branding for this year, with the date and the um, URL that you can go for registration. Um, my apologies. Um, all right. Now that that's there, here are our presenters, and I will just make one note before we introduce everyone that we also have um, Paul Brody on the line. Um, from the city of Hamilton, and he's going to join us for the panel discussion after these two presentations. So Natalie, I'm going to hand it back over to you here. Okay, so uh, our first speakers are uh, Dave Peterson and Kent Foster, and they're going to be talking about uh, GTHA laneway house case study. And then after that, from uh, Doug Terry Homes, we have uh, Miyoko Oikawa and Stephanie Coleman talking about uh, St. Thomas Tiny Homes case study that they worked on. Thank you. So Dave, I've just given you the screen share controls. Thank you, Adam. There we go. Um, are we good to go? Looks good. Um, and Adam, just for Q&A, we're, we're holding Q&A to, uh, to the end of the presentation, is that correct? That's right. Okay, perfect. So um, Kent and I will take you through sort of our experiences um, doing this um, through our entity. Um, Kent, my uh, the co-founder of City STEM and, and my business partner is uh, is a licensed architect, um, has some pretty cool concepts, and loves working in, on small sort of bespoke, balanced buildings. Um, my background is is more on the building science side of things, and so the two of us sort of combine to work to create these um, intensified designs that are designed again to fit some of these difficult sites and to um, help sort of densify these these um, communities that really we have in our backyards, uh, so to speak. We'll be looking at the laneway um, typology specifically, but also looking at things like 
um, SDUs, um, which are currently on hold in the city of Toronto, but certainly alive and well in Hamilton in terms of the ability to, to build one of these without connection to a, a laneway. Um, and so we'll be taking you through some of our experiences specifically, um, some op opportunities and obstacles, let's say, um, in terms of, of moving this um, forward. So let's take a look at a couple of definitions. And again, this is sort of uh, fairly typical and, and consistent both in the city of Toronto and Hamilton. There are some differences in the as of right requirements in, in both of these those municipalities, but more similarities than differences. Um, and so again, these are designed as non-severable units. Um, they remain under the same ownership as the main dwelling in, in the property itself. And that property then is part and parcel of this design. It's already owned by the, um, the people developing these. Um, and certainly we have multiple uses, uh, I think, for laneway residences, specifically, again, rental housing. We'll talk a bit more about the affordability of that in a couple of slides and, and if it does sort of fit that affordable um, housing uh, component. Um, certainly also we're seeing a lot of our prospective clients looking at multi-generational living, so multiple generations of the same family, uh, almost homesteading uh, on a property um, with maybe aging parents being close by and, and those aging parents being able to take care of um, uh, maybe grandchildren as well. So there's a real interesting sort of dynamic there um, as well. And aging in place is the other component that we see uh, very often people looking well ahead and suggesting maybe we move into the laneway residence, we end up renting out the main dwelling units and maybe that's how we're going to handle, um, you know, our, our golden years. So some really interesting dynamics happening on that side. And these are things that we've seen um, in, in our prospective clients ask for. Um, Certainly, I think the other component here that we'll bring into this and as, as well the tiny home discussion is, is the way of supporting uh, densification or intensification without creating uh, other challenges. These are sort of underutilized um, sites uh, mostly um, and to densify these and create communities in areas where there really isn't a connection to community in place um, is really sort of one of the in intentions I think of the as of right process to, to incentivize people to, to build in these, um, these areas. So let's talk about um, why laneway suites is sort of a, a tool to, to help densify thoughtfully. Um, certainly this gentle densification or thoughtful densification is something that's on the tip of most planners um, and architects and, and clients understand this, that we're not creating um, a, a dwelling unit here that, that removes daylight, uh, removes access to views and uh, very often fits onto an area that's underutilized or maybe sometimes a bit nefarious in terms of what people would think of a, an alley might be. Uh, certainly laneways are, are not alleyways in that these are actually vibrant communities and sort of designed and, and meant to be so. Um, the multi-generational living certainly, um, big component here, just one second please. Um, and again, we talked about this uh, a slide ago, just again, connecting with family um, and the challenge, of course, with, with younger, the younger generation and, and the affordability aspect of this is, is another consideration, certainly for looking at building these. Um, gener generational wealth um, certainly ties into that discussion as well. Um, affordable housing, we'll talk about that in a second because I think everybody has a slightly different um, view of what affordability is today. Um, and I think anything within the GTA H is, is generally speaking difficult from an affordability perspective, but we'll talk a bit about costs and rental rates and sort of um, when you do look at laneway suites, they seem to be the most affordable from a per, per square foot rate because we already have um, the land sort of locked into this um, uh, cost. So we're looking at then design and construction costs um, without sort of that large component of the land cost coming into this. And it does seem to be one of the most affordable ways of, of building new and, and creating um, um, these units. So we're looking at sort of that massive growth within the GTA specifically of you know 100,000 plus new residents a year. How do we deal with these people? And it's interesting that the trends have certainly changed. I do quite a bit of work in my consultancy on part three buildings and so sort of, you know 2018-2019 we definitely saw a, a shift in, in away from a condominium, a multi-unit residential into owned and operated rental housing. And again, a lot of this being connected to the affordable housing stream as well. Um, you know, programs like um, uh, were mentioned, the uh, Enbridge um, uh, programs connecting to these are quite effective. Again, it, it's sort of incentivizing development and, and you know, opening up these units uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. so this is one component we can take a look at. Um, 
The DC charge deferral, again, is something that the Toronto um, and Hamilton markets uh, have done. Again, this is a way of saving money, incentivizing um, this, this thoughtful densification and, and connect again to an as of right bylaw, uh, that's the city of Toronto specifically, um, that allows us to defer these DC charges. Um, the city of Toronto does one step further and, and actually has an affordable laneway suites pilot program, which is a forgivable loan up to 50,000 connected to sort of a 15 year um, occupancy where rents may not exceed the city of Toronto average market rents. Um, and we do talk to a lot of our clients and, and showcase this program. We haven't had a lot of interest in that so far. That might be something that we can chat a bit uh, more about uh, after this discussion um, to, to see maybe why that is and, and sort of what some of the challenges are. But we're happy to share some, sort of some of the anecdotal information given to us by prospective clients on this. Um, from a budgetary perspective, we're looking at sort of a design permitting range uh, in terms of, of designing and, 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 uh, and submitting for permit, you know, between 20 and 25,000. Construction costs that we're seeing in the typical sort of 800 to about 11 or sorry 1200 square foot um, uh, unit size that fits most of the lots that, that apply to the as of right requirements. We're seeing construction costs anywhere from 380,000 to about 550,000. Um, that puts us sort of at 380 to about $440 a square foot construction. Um, of course, we have to add typical soft costs to these as well in terms of landscape design and, and other components. So you might argue that this is not affordable. Um, it's certainly sort of the current market and where we are with construction uh, costs. Um, if you own the land already, then looking at the uh, total investment sometimes uh, makes up that difference. And if we're looking to make these as rental units, and we have a couple of our clients that are doing that specifically, um, we're seeing sort of the two bedroom um, typical designs that we're working on, looking at generating anywhere from about $32 to $3,800 per month in the Toronto market, although we've seen uh, rental rates in laneway suites go up to the $5,000 a month range. In Hamilton, that market, and the stats might be a bit old here, but you know between $2,000 and $2,600, um, the Hamilton market is, is, is on fire currently, and I think that those rental rates are probably low for uh, people contemplating building this type of stock and then renting it out. Um, Kent, you want to talk a bit about the permitting challenges that we've run into, or maybe some of the opportunities here as well, uh, specific to the uh, the Toronto and Hamilton markets? Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, can you hear me? I'm off of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Hamilton, surprisingly, actually was the original entity which initiated this whole um, laneway suite uh, program. Um, so they initiated it, Toronto um, kind of took it on and Toronto has been a lot more progressive in terms of how they've looked at this and they they obviously see the need for this, I think, more than more than Hamilton does. Um, so they've been, you know, very um, willing to and eager to make changes in, in how they look at this as of right by law. Um, I won't get into the nitty gritty of exactly what you need to do in order to make your laneway suite as of right. You've always been able to build a laneway suite in Toronto and there are some there are there are a few in Toronto that have been you know around for a long time. Um, I guess if there's a question of as of right and what does that mean it's it basically it means that if you fit within the prescriptive path it's been basically allocated um, from the city your neighbor can't say anything whereas before you were always able to do it but if your neighbor didn't like it it would have to go to committee and basically they could shut it down. So so now that, that's the benefit of this whole as of right um, umbrella, uh, which is really cool because it, there is a lot of opportunity um, as to what you can do uh, with with some of these uh, some of these buildings. It's Toronto, I can build larger buildings in Toronto, Hamilton, a little more, you know, they're a little more hesitant. I don't think they've they've pushed it as hard as Toronto has because I don't think they've seen the demand. Um, but we've designed in both, and um, I, I guess the the image that you're looking at right there is a, a project that we're working on um, on Jane Street. Very very uh, atypical lot, kind of a pie shaped lot, um, and you know it's it's this 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 particular homeowner as dave had mentioned is actually moving into this unit with her two kids and she's renting out her main house so you know a lot of these people are saying you know i love i love where we are i love the location 
Um, I don't want to move from here. However, I know I can build something that's going to be nicer. And actually, I Dave, correct me if I'm wrong. Is this not bigger than what she's going to be living in currently in her house? I think it's actually larger. Amazingly, it's a thousand. Main, the the it's unit that she's living. she's living. Correct. Yeah. Hey, so, Jens, can I just interrupt um, for one so second? We have one question uh, that I thought was very important, yeah. which is, can you tell us what AOR is as of right, I believe? And what's COA? Committee of Adjustment. Committee okay. of Adjustment. So we actually yeah, went yeah. through Committee of Adjustment on this particular um, project because there are stipulations. Well, this particular one, we all, it was an eight inch difference for the, the, the rear uh, abutting uh, property line, abutting the laneway. I think it was an eight inch uh, tolerance. So they, they they specify that you want three and a half meters um, at the rear property line abutting the laneway. And we were just just shy of that. So we had to go to committee of adjustment and pay a lot of money in order to to get this thing off the ground. But but we 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 passed and all is good. So um, Toronto is very progressive. Hamilton's lacking behind. I think Brody might uh, get into that maybe a little bit more in what he's doing because um, he's also designing a laneway suite. We're doing one for him um, so he can get into a little bit more of the Hamilton side of things because he works for the city. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the challenge is, again, um, it, it's a new building typology. There's a lot of individuals within the city that are seeing these, seeing these things come through and they're not fully aware of exactly how to approach the approval of these so i think by working with um i won't just tell city stem but you know anyone that's kind of a professional within this specific building typology is beneficial to work with because they've built the connections um, with individuals within the city in order to to kind of streamline the process um because it is a it's a very unique typology which a lot of the individuals within the city are not fully aware of yet and and this it's only the the demand of these is is crazy um I mentioned the, the the i mean the cost of building one of these things versus buying a 600 square foot condo in toronto you know you're 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 less to build one of these than to buy that and your roi is i mean i don't know if we're getting into roi today or not but um it's it's a much it's a better investment at the end of the day. Ken, let's go through some specific details now just to showcase sort of what we've we've just highlighted. So let's take a look at some of the things that we've run into um, as a design build entity. And again, I'm sure everyone has run into these scenarios because each of these lots that we're looking at, each of the connections to um, these laneways are different. And so it, it creates, I think, a lot of opportunity for from a design perspective to fit the neighborhood. There's a lot of really neat things for, for us to look at. There's some challenges as well. And the first one I'm going to point out here is low impact design. So when we say LID or low impact design, it has a lot to do with, with hydrology, with stormwater, um, how we're actually allowing um, you know, a highly or densified environment with a lot of paved surfaces to still infiltrate water without now putting in a, a strain on the infrastructure, specifically a stormwater management. And anybody in, on this call who connects with a part three building with the Toronto Green Standard knows skin deep how challenging some of these stormwater or LID components are to achieve in tall buildings. The city itself is not maybe specifically pointing to this, but has requirements again in softscaping for both the front and rear of these units uh, that we have to maintain. And it can create some challenges, although it's very important as we again sort of create imperme impermeable surfaces by putting a laneway residence in we have to ensure that the balance of front yard and rear yard has enough um, permeance so that we're not impacting our neighbors. Um, this is a, a key point because if we're just pushing water onto their lots, we're creating challenges um, in these neighborhoods. And we don't want to do that. We want to be able to sort of work with the existing site. Um, it certainly creates challenges from, from an outdoor amenity a design perspective and, and sort of patios, pavers connections how do we sort of create living space outside because these are small designs to begin with while still maintaining this um, so that's the one challenge that we have and it, it's it's certainly something we we take seriously because the outside space in these small designs is in my opinion as important as the interior space in terms of livability the other one is we are seeing a lot of sites that have challenges in terms of where they're located uh, based on floodplains um, and then high water table sites and, and Kent and I focus we don't do basements on our designs we run into so many challenges and we'll talk a bit about that with tree canopy cover in a second 
um, with looking at basements and, and the cost of doing a basement, that um, it's something that we've just sort of removed from this. But we do see designs every now and then. This is an example of one that's actually in a floodplain where the designer has had to maximize the interior ceiling heights to create sort of an improved livable space that they've brought their ground floor below grade. And this is again, part of that 100 year floodplain. So, you know, there's some real challenges from a, from a design perspective, um, the least of which might not be that, you know, the insurance companies will, will get word of this and, you know, insuring these properties where we do have flooding potential. Um, and if we're not designing around uh, mitigating that with, um, with both the materials and our designs, there's going to be further challenges. And I think we'll see that evolve as, as LID evolves, especially on part nine builds. The, the, the tree protection zone, this is again one of the great things about a lot of these mature alleyways is that we have beautiful um, mature trees that really add a lot of value to reducing uh, urban heat island effect, that certainly sequester carbon, that create shade for, for these residences in the summer months. And there's so many reasons why we need to have trees and, and Toronto is very proactive and as is the city of Hamilton in terms of this urban canopy and make, making sure that we don't just maintain it, but we actually add to it. Um, and so we have some very specific um, requirements there, chapter 8, 13, articles 1, 2, and 3 as designers that we look to. And this is a complex series of documents. And if you don't know trees, my understanding of trees is more about the materials that we use for construction, not about the living entity. Um, that we're you know, actively looking for an arborist now to add to our team on these because it's becoming increasingly challenging on, on these sites to make sure that we can meet those requirements to maintain the tree uh, coverage um and and the constructability concerns connecting to that so something certainly that you need to look for um, if you're working on any of these designs or connecting to construction of these um, is that and here's a great example of a laneway in the leslieville area where the north end of that laneway is is well suited to um, uh, these types of, of building systems as we get closer to eastern avenue the south end, we can see that there's you know some very massive mature trees in these backyards that would really preclude the the owners of, of these properties building to these standards even if they were as of right because of um, these challenges with the trees um, designing cost constraints these are again just some of the highlights and um, we could probably spend an entire hour just talking about these because there's certainly a lot of balance that has to happen um, we find very often that in, in certain some of the older uh, neighborhoods we have a highly dense um, or high density within the laneway you can see here in this photo to the top left, we have just a, a lot of garages. The challenge is, of course, if we're shoehorning a, a build to sort of zero setbacks on either side, which we're allowed to do, what happens to the neighboring properties? If we do have to dig, if we do have to um, shore up the neighboring um, uh, buildings, this adds a lot of cost and, and some certainly some challenges um, in terms of just getting materials and equipment in there to do the work. Um, of course, right after that would be the staging of construction equipment and materials. Um, thankfully, the industry does have a lot of smaller um, machines available designed for tight sites. Um, and we very often have to use these, you know, um, um, crane mounted, uh, mounted onto the back of smaller trucks to move larger panels or components. Um, even just placing these materials in a safe spot, um, you know, away from uh, the potential for not just um, uh, degradation based on what's happening with the weather, but certainly also from a, um, a theft perspective has to be taken into account. So there's some things there that we, we see as, as being challenges, although certainly surmountable challenges. Um, one of the bigger ones that we run into that very often is a go, no go scenario is the limiting distance for fire. Um, less so in Hamilton, where we have a, a bit of a broader definition in terms of where hydrants have to be placed for life safety. In the city of Toronto, um, the first design that Kent mentioned earlier, we've already had to do an NFPA 13D um, approach, which is basically a residential sprinkler system that allows the fire department more time to actually get to that um, site to connect their hoses um, and, and to create life safety for the occupants of that. And that's a great thing. We have the technology to do so. It automatically adds twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars to the price list if we have to do one of these residential sprinkler designs. Um, there are some benefits, obviously, on the, um, the insurance side of the equation. The insurance companies like to see these, but um, very often it's a go/no-go -no -go scenario. This detail below showcases how we sort of look at positions of hydrants within sort of the uh, bearing of the residents. And in this case, this client 
was not able to follow any as of right requirements based on um, the limiting distance needs that the city has called out. Um, so certainly some challenges there. Uh, we talked a bit about tree canopy and coverage. Um, we connect to the main dwelling in terms of our services, and that's the other thing, especially in older neighborhoods. We are seeing that very often we have to upgrade those services in the main house because often these homes can be over 100 years old, some 150 plus years old, and to connect to water, sewage, gas, and electrical infrastructure um, that isn't designed to easily be connected to um, can create its own challenges as well. And we see that pretty much on every uh, project. Cost certainly is connected to this uh, component. And then sloped sites, not just sloped in terms of what's happening with LID and drainage to the neighboring properties, but if we have to start looking at pump systems for moving gray and black water, um, again, from the laneway, which may be lower than the main residence, can create some challenges. Uh, construction challenges, these are sort of a continuation of this discussion. And here we very often get into scenarios where we're a zero um, setback on, onto the neighboring properties. If there are garages in place, um, you know, how do we clad the outside of those walls? How do we ensure that we have, first of all, non-combustible cladding systems? to again meet life safety requirements um, and these challenges. And, and uh, Kent and I use an approach, not atypical of a lot of, I think, builders today looking at panelized construction. So for us, we look at mitigating the amount of time it takes to build these. Um, that's not just great for the client, especially clients looking to maybe get these into the rental pool earlier, but it's especially important in terms of your relationship with your neighbors, um, because in ex you know a process that might take nine to 12 months, a more typical build, um, would certainly strain that relationship. And we've actually had prospective clients say to us, listen, we really want to build one of these. We're such good friends with our neighbors and they are so dead set against us doing this that just out of respect for them and our friendship, we're not moving ahead. So although through the as of right process, we don't have to have our neighbors permission to build these. Um, there's a lot of people that still value that, those good neighbor relationships more so than being able to build one of these. And that's one of the challenges um, that we've seen. I mean, other challenges in terms of what happens if the build gets tagged with graffiti, which is again a pretty pretty commonplace, not just in the city of Toronto, but in Hamilton as well. Do we have materials that can be easily cleaned and updated until we have really more of a community in that laneway? The first couple of builds are kind of almost islands unto themselves. And so looking at materiality becomes pretty important as well. Um, you know, maintaining Passive approaches, which is something that Kent and I look at in our designs, are important. Passive ventilations, passive daylight strategies. How do we ensure that these buildings are efficient um, and, and really don't rely heavily on mechanical systems to make them comfortable, that we have resiliency built into this again? And that's something that the TGS talks about very specifically. And I think it really needs to trickle down into some of this uh, thoughtful densification that we're looking at. Um, the other thing is wrapped slab foundations are something that we focus on. It minimizes our impact to the site and it creates passive comfort, resilience, um, and we don't have to dig, we don't have to shore based on some of these tight sites. And so our approach is there. Um, don't just look at performance, but certainly constructability becomes critically important for us um, when it comes to these design decisions. And I'll leave the presentation with basically looking at how we sort of, the matrix that we use with our clients, where we do focus on low energy buildings, we do focus on at least one step ahead of um, where code puts us to ensure that our clients are, are sort of well established there, right through to net zero ready levels of, of insulation, um, air tightness, um, high performance windows. Again, balanced with the facade materials um, it is critically important. From a mechanical system perspective, we do a lot of work with um, VRF systems or sort of mini splits of refrigerant based technologies. There are benefits to the client as well, other than just um, sort of efficiency, carbon footprint, footprint and first cost there. They tend to run in, in very small spaces. And so we can have these connections to uh, mechanical systems without having a lot of bulkheading on the interior. And that creates the feel of, of a much larger interior space than these small designs may dictate. So a big part of that is, is to sort of balance not just the efficiency, but also how we live inside and outside of these spaces. So that's something we look at. Um, and certainly durability and longevity, I think, are critically important. If we're going to build, and especially at the rates that I'd mentioned earlier, this is not inexpensive construction. And we want to make sure that we can create, a, again, a durable, healthy environment so that people can age in place, um, can have multiple generations of family living and homesteading on the same um, property. 
um, you know, with comfort and, and all these other components that we would expect to see uh, from the built environment, but that don't always happen. So I think we'll leave it there. Let's talk a bit about sort of tiny homes. And if there's any questions or comments, uh, we'll take them now, or we can maybe leave them more for the, uh, the larger discussion at the end of the piece. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And thank you, Kent, um, for that presentation. What we will do is I am going to hand the screen over to Miyoko. And while we do that, we just I just have one question that um, uh, has come in and I think you can answer quickly, which is um, uh, you mentioned the development charges, uh, development charge deferrals. And uh, so we have the question of um, is this uh, enough of a savings that it is incentivizing it? Like how much on a on average project would this save someone? Can't you want to take that one? It's about 50 grand. Yeah, hey, it's about $50,000. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Plus, okay, plus so or minus, yeah. But uh, it, it's definitely massively incentivizing to do this versus going, like I, like I had mentioned earlier, versus going and buying a, a condo, pre-development right. condo or something like that, right? It's... Um, there is another benefit it's, that we didn't yeah, It's significant. And, and that would be an HST rebate. Now that requires us to stay below $450,000 construction costs, but that's certainly doable. And we have units now in, in sort of in, in the pipeline that we're doing for less than that. And, you know, again, that's pretty substantial for the homeowner if they can, if they can apply for an HST rebate on top of the development charge um, uh, deferral. So those two things do certainly add up. Okay. All right. I think we'll we'll come back um, to the question of costs um, later in the panel discussion. But um, thank you very much for that presentation, um, Miyoko. Are you all set there? Perfect. And Stephanie is on. Great. All right, um, gents. If you don't mind uh, hopping off camera for now, we'll have Miyoko and Stephanie um, present, and then we'll invite you back in after they wrap up. Great. Thanks. Um, good morning, or good afternoon, rather. I'm Miyoko Ikawa, the Manager of Research and Innovation here at Doug Terry Limited, and I'm joined by Stephanie Coleman, who is our Chief Sustainability Officer, to talk to you a bit about our project here in St. Thomas called Tiny Hope. I can click through. There we go. Um, so just a bit about Doug Terry Homes. Uh, if you're not familiar with us as a company, we're a multi-award-winning home builder here in St. Thomas. Uh, we were actually the first builder to build and label over 200 net zero homes in Canada under CHVA's net zero program. Since 2019, all of our low rise homes have been built to CHVA's net zero ready as standard, um, which is actually a, a significant improvement over a code built home. And as a company, we've been recognized by EBA, CHBA and Enter Quality for the construction of both our mid-rise and now our high-rise buildings. Um, <clears throat> St. Thomas, like many other places in Canada, is facing a serious housing crisis with a lack of safe, affordable housing options. Many families and individuals struggle even just to pay rent while working two jobs. Considering inflation of rental prices, uh, fixed incomes of families and a near zero vacancy rate, many people can't find accommodations. And uh, to note many, um, <clears throat> the most vulnerable people here are women and youth. So as we look at this spectrum of housing options or the continuum of housing, there's a need for different types of buildings. We need emergency shelters or special needs types. Uh, we need assisted living facilities, so supportive housing or community housing. There's a great need for rental housing and home ownership. And then also this other market for rentals, which falls under that, uh, that market rate as well. Project Tiny Hope uh, is built on or just off of a major street in St. Thomas called Talbot. It's on Kane Street and it fills in this uh, affordable rental. So within that housing continuum, we're filling in that space. And it's a project that's going to be owned and operated by the YWCA. 
Doug Terry Homes is responsible for the construction project management of that, uh, the construction of both the mid-rise and these tiny home units. And then we're also partners with Sanctuary Homes as well on this. Uh, so as you can see, um, closer to Kane Street here, we have the apartment building, which is four stories, uh, likely to have about 20 to 24 one to two bedroom units. Uh, and then on the base of that building will be supports for the YWCA. So really they're meant as uh, live-in units, highly affordable rental units for people that need to access supports from the YWCA. And that may include counseling services, so counseling rooms in the base. Uh, there will be a communal kitchen uh, to help support food insecurity. And then here we're showing 20 tiny home units. And that's a mix of one and two bedroom units. And so we've thought about the different types of buildings that could be on this plot of land and the needs of the different types of people or peoples that, that may be accessing the YWCA services. So as, as we start to see them um, transition to these tiny homes, it could be someone that requires accessibility. Uh, it could be families that have needs that aren't really suitable to a, an apartment building. And then the site itself has a community playground area, um, edible gardening. And then on, on the right there, you can see some of the archetypes that we were playing with in terms of design. So this is the design of the two story that we've finally uh, come up with. And to the right of that, uh, 3D rendering, you can see the, the inside of the main floor and the second floor and, and what the space will look like. We've had a few design challenges with this site, uh, both with the tiny homes and the apartment building. So the apartment building itself is an all electric building, which um, when you're applying for CMHC, Seed funding and co-investment funding means that we have to model it to any CV, which uh, provides some challenges in achieving those higher levels uh, or higher points to receive greater coverage uh, because we have to compare an all-electric building to an all-electric building. So something that is actually better designed than uh, a building that includes natural gas um, ends up coming out at a lower overall energy reduction um, just because of that comparison. So it's it's been difficult for us. We also have to show that we can hit a net zero level um, with the application of solar. So for that building type in particular, it becomes difficult to locate all the solar that we need just on the roof of the building. Uh, so in the slide before, you can see that we were looking at areas within the site that we can include solar like covered parking. For the tiny homes, again, the same issue with the requirement of hitting net zero, uh, locating those additional panels as well. Cost of construction um, for both buildings is uh, difficult to um, balance between this idea of energy efficiency and um, the owner operating costs for the YWCA. The energy consumption for the buildings themselves and the equipment sizing and domestic hot water loads. A lot of times when people think of tiny homes, they think uh, that the energy, the energy usage will be significantly lower than an attached building or a regular detached single family home. Uh, and oftentimes with the water consumption side, it's a lot higher than we anticipate because the occupant load is, is still fairly high for the, the people that are occupying that small space. I'm gonna throw it to Stephanie, who's done a, a lot of work looking at uh, the cost of construction and uh, the operating costs for the YWCA. Thank you, Miyoko. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, um, so actually, yeah, Natalie had, had uh, spoke to the uh, the affordability kind of criteria that we're working with, and so she had mentioned in her presentation about um, thirty percent uh, of the household's income before tax is the figure that we're working with, uh, but then we're looking at eighty percent of the of um, 
of the CMHC's uh, median market rate uh, being the figure that we're working for um, as it relates to affordable housing. So I'll show you that in just a minute, but 30% uh, of our units, uh, you know, we would need to hit this 80% uh, reduced uh, rent rate based on CMHC's figures. So when we talk about affordable housing, um, and we're talking about trying to hit, you know, 30% of your income uh, before tax as your housing um, expenses, I guess you could say, if it's a rental, that would include both your rent and then also your utilities, while if it was a home ownership, um, it would be your mortgage, property taxes, condo fees, and also your, your, your utility uh, fees as well. Next slide. There it is. Okay, so what we did was um, I looked at both median and uh, St. Thomas and median Ontario uh, pricing, just for this example here. Um, CMHC has released their 2021 rental uh, rates, which is that um, figure that we look at, the 80% reduction um, piece. And so those are the figures that we look at. And then uh, for StatsCan, um, they have done the new census and uh, they're slowly releasing the information. So I don't have um, current StatsCan data. So that's why 2016 is listed here. But if we were to look at uh, St. Thomas two bedroom rentals, the median uh, rate back in 2016 was $822. Uh, in 2021, it says $1,050. So that's about a, almost a 30% increase over the last five years. Uh, I used an average of $283 a month for utility rents, uh, for utility rates. I had found that um, online for Ontario. So I used that across the board just to come up with a figure here. And um, so using that math, uh, 2020 rental of a two bedroom, at a median rate of 1,050 plus your $283 for your uh, utilities, you're looking at about $1,333 a month estimated housing cost uh, in St. Thomas in 2021. However, what we're finding is even though CMHC's figure says it's 1,050 and that's based on last year's data, what we're finding is that in reality, a two bedroom is going for more like $1,800 a month plus utilities. Um, so there is a bit of a challenge in that the, the CMHC data uh, does seem to be lower than what we're experiencing um, uh, in, in particularly in new builds that are just starting to come up and, and go on the market. Like there's a, a building in our area, uh, one bedrooms are going for 1500 and uh, two bedrooms are going for 1800. So you can see that's a bit of a disparity between the figures that we're having to work with for CMHC and uh, what's really happening in the market. Uh, in Ontario, I just put that uh, the CMHC numbers uh, plus, you know, the, the utilities uh, at about almost $1,700 a month. Uh, however, when we look at median household incomes, so these are just the median rate for, for household incomes in 2021. Um, if I use a 15% uh, increase over 2016, because again, I don't have the 2021 data yet, they haven't released it, stats can. Um, so what I've used here is 15% increase over the last five years in income uh, based on some data that I found. And uh, so that would be a median St. Thomas income will be about $1,718. So $1,718 for the income, $1,333 for the housing expense, that looks you know, reasonably in balance, although we're finding in reality that actual rent is much higher. Um, and then Ontario, you can see the comparison there, 2100 versus 1700. Uh, but when we start looking at particularly um, marginalized or lower type income households, and so I pulled data for the one parent household income. And so it, the estimate for 2021 is about $1,300 um, of income. So you can see that $1,300 of income is almost pretty much the same as uh, the $1,300 of, of rent based on the lower CMHC uh, pricing. So that's kind of a break even in kind of a best case scenario. But what we're finding is that uh, because the housing market is so hot, um, a lot of uh, landlords are selling their homes and um, new landlords are buying them and then increasing the rent. Um, so that sort of data doesn't seem to be reflected in um, all of these um, pricings that we're seeing right now. And um, particularly because the market has been particularly hot um, over the last one to two years. So I think there's a bit of a lag in the results uh, getting through to CMHC, or I suspect that's what's happening. 
Um, so that's something that we need to, to keep an eye on. Now, if you could go to the next slide. So tiny home considerations. Um, you know, what What are the needs that you have? So as I mentioned, we are having a lot of displacement with families uh, where uh, families are renting, uh, the house is being, so I, I hear it almost a weekly basis where the house is being sold out from under them and they have to find a new place. When they have to go find a new place, uh, the rent is considerably more than what they have been paying. So there is, you know, needs of families, needs of um, single family households. Uh, seniors is another one that I've heard where um, you know maybe they've rented all their lives they don't they're, they're on a very fixed income they don't have any sort of nest egg to to draw from and they are getting displaced or needing to move into affordable housing because their fixed income hasn't gone up the same rate as as uh, rental has gone up but other things that we're looking for in tiny homes you know accessibility there's a bit of a of a, a challenge between the larger square foot uh, requirements of barrier free or accessibility with tiny homes so, so that creates a bit of a challenge when you're trying to meet this need. Storage is another one. So, you know, understanding what those needs are and how willing, willing people are to um, sort of compromise on, on some of these um, in, the, in the tiny home space. And so how much square foot footage do you need? Uh, sometimes, you know, people want the tiny home price, but they want a larger uh, type of square footage. I mean, the other thing too is a kitchen and a bathroom. There are certain minimums that, that you can only build to. I mean, you do need a fridge, a stove, um, you know, you do need several appliances. So, so um, a sink, you know, so how, you know, how small can you really actually go? Um, and then another question is, are they attached to the foundation or are they mobile? That changes uh, the types of rules that you have to uh, meet. And so, for example, you know, if it's attached to the ground and you're having to work within the current building code, uh, one thing that we had run into recently was the master bedroom size. So the building code says it needs to be a minimum of like 105 square feet, whereas an average uh, regular bedroom can be about 75 square feet. Well, when you have to put in a master square feet, uh, square foot bedroom, and then you wanna make a two or a three bedroom, it's forcing the size of the home to be bigger. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to put it on it as a two story. So then it's also increasing the size of the footprint of the main floor. So it, it it's this kind of a, a dance or a chess game or a balance between between some of these challenges that you have to work with. Stairs can only be a certain you know, width. Uh, and, and so we're kind of working within rules that have not been really built around uh, tiny homes. And so working with the municipality, getting you know, exceptions from, from the building department and that sort of thing are, are, are things that we're, we're pursuing. You know, is land included in the price? Um, the house building costs. So there's a, an economies of scale challenge. So tiny homes actually, um, can cost more per square foot than a larger home uh, per square foot. And that's because it's smaller. And so there's certain flat costs that you have, whether it's a small home or a big home. Um, and so, so you can end up with a, a very high square footage price. And I'll get into that in just a second. I mentioned the building code uh, challenges, zoning challenges were talked about a, a little bit before. So um, let's look at an example of, of tiny home uh, costing. So. Uh, I, I was talking with somebody who, who builds a CCAN type of uh, prefab homes. Uh, they come in sort of set sizes and the price point was in and around 230 to 250 a square foot, um, but that didn't include any sort of sh um, shipping uh, or the land or any sort of connection fees, for example, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, um, or the install, the craning, craning in place. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of a prefab uh, type home. Stick frame, now this one shows $300 a square foot. Uh, in our first pass, um, we were seeing a figure of more than $400 a square foot in our, in our first uh, estimation. So we've had to do a bit of a rework from the design that Miyoko sh uh, showed you because that was done at the beginning of this when we started this project a couple of years ago. Um, and prices we found in the industry generally have exponentially increased due to labor and um, material cost increases. So this particular scenario shows $300 a square foot, which is, I believe, conservative, um, because I know I've heard anywhere from three, $350, 380 to over $450 a square foot. Uh, so using 300 as a very conservative number, we've got um, 600 square foot, two bedrooms. So that's the size of the two bedroom that we're 
uh, working with uh, 180,000, just some simple math there. Um, using the mortgage calculation based on a 25 year mortgage at a 5% interest with no down payment. I just wanted to figure out what the actual mortgage cost would be on the 180. That's about 1,050 bucks. Uh, is there property tax depending on, you know, this is a nonprofit. So I believe the property tax is waived once everything is up, up and running. Um, but for private owner, obviously they would have property tax on that. And then there's maintenance cost, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that is $557 a month. Now you may think that sounds outrageous, but I'll show you where that number comes from in, in just a minute. So if we add all that math together, you're looking at $1,842 a month, right? where what we talked about for the one parent household, they, they're available per month is 1300. And when we talked about the average uh, household, not just a one parent, but the average uh, median, the median uh, household income for an average family, um, that was about $1,700 a month. So we're already um, exceeding that based on uh, this scenario and these, these construction costs. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now this is hard to read, um, but I wanted to kind of give you the, the, the 30,000 foot overview. So when we're talking about operational costs, um, particularly as a, as a landlord, um, there are a number of different uh, expenses that this particular project has to incur. You've got um, uh, maintenance uh, organized or companies that, that need to not only do the labor for the maintenance, but also all the materials for the maintenance. You've got turnover costs relating to one tenant moves out, a new tenant moves in. There's costs for cleaning, maintenance, repairs, that sort of thing. We've got uh, different types of insurance that is required. You've got waste collection that's required. Um, for the playground, there's an annual fee for playground. Uh, they they have included a community support coordinator uh, that's built into uh, all of those uh, maintenance costs. But the other thing that's in there is a minimum of a 4% effective um, replacement reserve, I guess you could say. And so what that is, is you're putting money away now in order to maintain the units in the future. And so what you see there is the total operating cost for 20 units is about $134,000. I can barely even read, read that, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then this is assuming that they have taken on a, uh, a $3 million mortgage. So there's a mortgage payment as well. Um, but I'll talk about the total project cost in just a minute. This is just the operational budget. So then I look at the rent. So now we talked about, uh, we have to use the CMHC uh, figures and a portion of those can be the CMHC amount, which is like your market rate, and then the re and 30 percent of them need to be 80 percent of that market rate so the reduced amount and so i've got those divided out there and i figure out what our total net income is now you'll notice i the actual total raw uh, net income would be over two hundred and two thousand dollars but because you do have turnover you can't assume that you're going to have full rent every single month in every single unit and so there's a calculation that's done to figure out your vacancy rate and your vacancy amount. So the remaining of the actual anticipated uh, income that you'll get is about $196,000. So doing some simple math on an annual basis, $196,000 for 20 units, less $134,000 for your operating costs, less your mortgage is 59, uh, at 59,000, leaves you about $3,000 left over at the end of the year. I'm gonna call it break even because kind of like uh, what was mentioned earlier, if you have a graffiti incident um, or if you have some sort of incident where some significant damage, that $3,000 is immediately um, eaten up. So let's call that a break even scenario. Okay, next. So this, <laughs> this is even smaller, but again, I'm showing you the overall big picture. This is where we're looking at long-term maintenance. And so this is a figure, you know how I mentioned that 4% that you uh, save in your reserve. Um, this calculation figures out what you can anticipate your long-term maintenance up to be and how much you need to actually put away today in order to uh, save for future um, maintenance costs. And so um, what this is doing is validating that 4%. If 
4% based on the expenses that we paid for the materials that we put in is not enough, then we need to save more earlier on. And so therefore our operating expenses will go up. So all, on the left side are all the construction items that are listed, your foundations, your kitchens, your, you know, ki your doors and trims, flooring, that sort of thing. And across the top is, I put a 50 year projection because the mortgage that, um, that we were looking at for, for the one was, was a 50 year. So that's why that shows that. Um, and so what those little pink dots are all, all along there are every time you need to replace or maintain that particular item. And so they tally up all at the bottom by year. So that's 50 years shown on that image just for uh, illustrative purposes. And it tallies up at the bottom and then there is a compounding inflation rate that's added to that. And then it's worked backwards so that you can figure out what you need to save today in order for paying for those maintenance costs in the future. Because the reality is if we paid, I don't know, $15,000 for a kitchen today, it's not gonna cost $15,000 in 20 years. It's going to be more simply because of inflation. So all of that uh, basically is calculated in um, and that impacts your operating costs. So when we're talking about um, rental units and when we're talking about affordable housing, the materials, even if you get them for free, the materials that you put into the home are really critically important because um, if say you put in expensive kitchen cabinets and they got damaged or you know just wore out over time and you want to replace them with the same um, your maintenance costs go up exponentially so that's why you see um in in rental units you will often see like durable floors good good um taps and that sort of thing that are that that are that are durable um but oftentimes you'll see say a thermofoil cabinet or, or laminate countertops and that sort of thing uh, just because they're looking at the long-term maintenance if you don't have the reserve saved early on uh, then the units will get run down because there's no money to actually do the maintenance on them and so this is why you can kind of see in certain areas or certain homes where they look rent run down um, it's often just because there wasn't enough uh, capital reserve uh, saved to do those maintenance over time next so the capital budget um, so what we did was uh, we, we put this figure in here and this is kind of at the end of the day i had shown there's like a, a an operational budget of about three hundred three thousand dollars that was that was remaining um but the actual cost of construction is about 20 million dollars and we've anticipated a mortgage of about three million dollars which means that we have to fundraise 17 million dollars on this project or we can look for a way to reduce the capital budget or both. And so that's what we're doing, like literally right now, we have um, taken a look at the tiny homes and we are now reconfiguring them a little bit to look at um, tiny towns, which I thought was kind of a cute name, but nonetheless, um, tiny towns looking at bringing some of the units together, trying to get a few more units um, on the property if we can to bring in more revenue um, and to serve more clients, um, but also looking at maybe some tiny uh, semis as well. So we're in the process of, of, uh, of rejigging the, the site plan and a little bit on the actual house plans um, to try to bring down that capital uh, cost for the project to help with uh, the pretty significant amount of fundraising and donations that is required for this particular project. Um, otherwise, if you if you don't do that, you you see that bottom line there is that would be kind of like your second mortgage um, on on if you didn't say have enough money. So you can see how that could become quickly unviable. Um, next, so the conclusion is is it possible to do this um, in an affordability uh, scenario? Um, the answer is yes. Um, is it going to be easy? No, um, we're finding that. It's, it is certainly a challenge and there's a lot of uh, learning and a lot of um, obstacles to, to overcome, but it will take time without any sort of major uh, funding injection from, say, government at all levels. What we do know is generally you see, you see the, um, the, the housing continuum that um, Yoko had, uh, um, had introduced earlier. You see poverty on the left, prosperity on the right, and generally speaking, 
people want to move towards prosperity. I don't know many people who have wanted to move in reverse. Um, and so what we need to do is try to, um, to encourage that, that movement along that path. We have a housing crisis today. Uh, it is worsened by the resale of market rates um, because of uh, landlords selling and then new ones buying and thus evictions are happening and then renters is going up. Uh, construction costs have uh, increased exponentially over the last couple of years. And, um, and the reality is, you know, there are some challenges or can be some challenges uh, with zoning, with NIMBYism, uh, with red tape and that sort of thing. And so um, these are sort of some, some things that we need to tackle and, and to overcome. And we do need financial support from all levels of government to help uh, provide the funding in order to get uh, more of these affordable units on, uh, on in, in the stream so that we can address uh, the significant uh, crisis that we're currently experiencing and seeing. You, you don't have to go very far on your local social media page to see um, people expressing their concerns on this front. So, um, so that is what I had to present. Wow, thank you. Um, that was intense, Stephanie. Uh, the going Sorry. through the going through the no just going through the reality of the numbers and trying to um, trying to make sense of all that with the scale is it, it becomes a very complex problem. Um, yeah. So thank you and Miyoko, thank you. Um, can I invite um, everyone back um, on camera to join us? Um, uh, Kent and Brody and Natalie, welcome back. So. Um, yeah, that that was that was really intense. I do not have a financial background, so seeing all the data like that was a lot for me, but really, really useful and very informative. Um, so to to kick off this panel discussion, I want to shift focus just a little bit, and I want to ask a, a question, sort of, to everyone. Um, about this, I'm gonna just call it the scale of building. So we're talking about different building types, but they're all sort of in the same scale. Um, so please, maybe we'll just sort of go around starting with Miyoko if we can. Um, do you think that this scale of buildings addresses um, the sustainability problems associated with the built environment? Um, if so, yes, and if not, how? Yeah. Um, yes and no. So I really like the idea of laneway units or accessory dwelling units to fill in that missing middle for uh, places like City of Toronto. I think that it's a really thoughtful way to increase density at the neighborhood level. Uh, when you say sustainability, and I'm sure Stephanie uh, can add on to this, that that encompasses so many different facets. Uh, and I think the problem with this, as she articulated, is that that solution is really only available to those who can afford it. And there's this whole uh, group of people that cannot afford even just renting below market. I'm like saying below market because as you've seen, it's not even indicative of below market uh, rental units. And, and so finding the best case for all types of people um, is is an area that I think needs more exploration. Thanks. Um, let's go to Natalie. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, so I think it's something that we are going to be seeing more and more of. In my program, we haven't had any any projects like this yet, but I've, I've started to have conversations with affordable housing providers who are looking at developing whole communities of tiny homes or laneway homes or garden homes. Um, so it's really interesting. So for the, for example, I was approached by a client the other day. Uh, they offer transitional housing. They're going to be building, um, you know, a big main structure, but also have some additional suites in the gardens. In it's called the garden suite in the backyard, um, and it, yeah, something that we look forward to finding out more about because it's it's the future for sure. Thanks, um, Brody. Uh, let me know if you can hear me. Okay, hopefully my mic's working okay there. Um, yeah, I definitely uh, I would agree with the, with what Mayoka previously said, and that this would be it's it's one piece of the picture in terms of when you think of sustainability, 
uh, from a housing perspective, like the way, like Ken had mentioned that we're in the process of, uh, uh, we're in the process of getting approval for uh, an SDU in our, uh, a laneway house in our, in our case. Um, and the way that we're going to transition it is at, at the beginning, we may to recoup some of our initial costs, we may have to charge, you know, we technically wouldn't be deemed to be affordable housing or, or um, you know, we'd have to be charged for the, with the mark, not like a market value rent at the moment. But down the road, what we're looking to do is transition it into a house for my retired parents. At that point, we're hoping that we could decrease the rent and have it paid off a significant portion of the mortgage by that point. And at that point, maybe then we can charge a little bit less rent because it's, you know, we've already made a significant investment into that, into the building and uh, it provides them, um, you know, the, an old, that older demographic, uh, an option for housing as well, which I think contributes to the overall sustainability of communities. And I think it's important to, 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 to accommodate everyone's needs. So. Okay, thanks. Um, Kent? I think you're on mute still. Um, I may be a little cynical on how I approach my view towards this. I know the whole concept of it is to be affordable and it's to create more housing, but from my experience, um, for the majority of the individuals that I have talked to, um, Brody, not necessarily your one, but <laughs> I'm not gonna blanket you with this statement, but um, a lot of people are taking advantage of the influx in housing crisis to take out HELOCs and home equity line of credits to to be able to do this to maximize um, their returns on their investment um, and capitalizing on on rental rates in Toronto. Um, so, do I think it's sustainable? And a lot of the, and Dave and I have talked to a lot of different uh, homeowners that are looking at doing this and. For them to be able to recoup or, or to fit into that sort of um, low income um, kind of rental rate um, kickback sort of scenario, I think you have to be 80% um, of the typical rental rate for you to be able to kind of fit into this um, to fit into the the, the 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 discussion. And most people just aren't interested. Um, they want to make as much money as they possibly can on this. So I think there may be some people out there that are willing to do it and i think as i think natalie was saying it's more in the, the larger developments of looking at these tiny homes as a and and what miyoko and stephanie had presented in terms of doug terry and what they're looking at doing i think that's where it can really fit um but in terms of toronto and hamilton these individuals it, it, they're homeowners that are just looking to try to um to make additional income at the end of the day or potentially move into it and then rent out their principal dwelling um, so it's, I don't think it's there yet, um, but I think it, it could get there, especially as the real estate market is, it, it, as interest rates start to rise and the, and the, the real estate market starts to kind of teeter and may hopefully come down a little bit. I think maybe that's when we'll start to see the affordability come into this, but as of right now, um, I, I, I don't see it. Okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, uh, Dave, same question. Um... So I'll just elaborate on, on what Kent said because we tend to work in lockstep with our clients and we ask these questions because we're truly um, wondering at also what the motivations are. So we do see this connection to keeping it in their, in their asset, the general uh, generational wealth sort of growth. We have not found any altruistic clients so far that are looking to give back or to create these opportunities. Um, not to say that they're not there, I just really think that, you know, the way that we go, especially in city living, the cost of, uh, of living in cities really just um, ensures that we have to sort of create a buffer around um, that to make it sustainable. And I think that's maybe what we've seen. Um, we have had some discussions with groups like City Housing Hamilton, maybe Brody can add to that as well, that are very progressive and thinking about some of these smaller, either a tiny home or, or sort of a laneway, a densified laneway, uh, creating a fourplex or sixplex or eightplex on some of the underutilized sites that are difficult to build more traditional construction on will be a really interesting way of sort of taking this you know building typology the performance the low cost the durability that we've been talking about that, that are so important for um, individual homeowners this is also important i think for cities that are looking to expand that and, and i think that will be a great discussion topic because there 
again, with programs like uh, CMHC's programs, then we can actually look at, at getting some subsidies and, and building these more affordably on sites that typically wouldn't get densified because they're too difficult to do in, in a traditional construction approach. Okay, thanks. And we'll come back uh, to Stephanie. Uh, I thought I'd give you a little breather there. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I did kind of uh, pour out a lot of information. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. I was thinking, you know, as I was listening to the presentations, it made a lot of sense for owners um, to use uh, to build this in their backyard or or even in kind of an infill situation on a weird piece of land that's hard to do anything else with. Like that, that kind of makes sense. But when I think about Whole community, whole communities of tiny homes, and I think about how, from a sustainability perspective, we're looking at densification. There seems to be a, you know, a, a little bit of a challenge there because we're using a lot of square foot for a lot of for a small amount of individuals. So, so there's a bit of a conflict there. Having said that, you know, so from that from that perspective, from an environmental perspective, but then I look at, well, it's a smaller building, so therefore it's less materials um, and therefore, you know, perhaps less carbon emissions from the operation operation of it um, and also therefore less carbon emissions from the, the embodied carbon, from the manufacturing of the materials themselves. So, you know, so, so there could be um, an advantage that way. Um, but yeah, it just seemed to me I mean, the other thing too, from more from a social perspective is if we were to get more units on stream that can help soften the kind of the economics 101 thing that's happening where, um, you know, the inflation of prices uh, because of housing shortage. Um, so it could have kind of a positive impact that way. But from all the math that I've done, it makes total sense from an owner's perspective. It's, it's a harder fit um, when it comes to uh, lower lower rental um, rates that we're trying to achieve. Right. Uh, okay, thank you all. That was, um, uh, th Stephanie, you actually answered, one of the questions, one, one of the comments I suppose that came in was, um, so far no one has mentioned uh, carbon emissions. So I'm glad that you tied it back in there. Cause that's one of, I think that's one of the things that comes out most about tiny homes is yeah, there's there's less material, um, sort of lower operating costs and thus lower energy, uh, energy consumption. Um, but if, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, there's, there's no inherent reason that this building type um, uses less carbon uh, or produces less carbon emissions, aside from that it is, you know, a, a smaller building uh, size. Um, speaking to that point, uh, I have a question that um, I'm going to say, whoever can answer it first can answer it. Um, while I queue up a question from uh, uh, one of our attendees, Marie James. Marie, I'm going to open your mic. Uh, the question that I'd like you to answer first, though, is um, what is the definition of a tiny home? When does it start? Uh, is it based on just size or is it, uh, uh, you know, does it require a, a basement, a foundation, any of those things? If someone could answer that. I think HGTV has, uh, has skewed our perception on what a tiny home is. Um, Dave, I don't know. What are you? What are your? What are your thoughts on that? That's a that's a tough question. What is a tiny home? I mean, do we look at a tiny condo in Toronto or a, a tiny home? Because at the end of the day, the way that we build these things, whether it's in Hamilton or Toronto, you know, whether it's 500 square feet or up to 1,700 square feet, I guess they're all considered tiny homes. But I mean, it, it the. The definition. There, I don't think there's a definition out there to say well, what is a tiny home. There's right? a, is it on a trailer. Yeah. It, well, that's one of the key ones. Is is it, is it portable? Can it be moved, or is it connected to a fixed foundation? And the, the code yeah. does not look at this home being a tiny home as if it's fixed to a foundation. It's just a small version of a regular Part Nine build. It can still be under 400 square feet, which is the other definition sort of for tiny homes. But the challenge here is, I think there's, you know. This word is, is, is almost, it's, it's, it's the Kleenex of our built environment. Um, you know, it's, it's whoever decides that they're gonna create a, a definition surrounding it, then that's what people see. And if you watch HGTV, you have a very different definition of maybe the one we've been talking about um, that's happening in St. Thomas. And so, yeah, sometimes that baseline understanding is really what we have to promote before we start with options. Well, I'll, I can tell you what the sizes are that we landed on for ours in order to meet the needs uh, was the one bedroom bungalow is 400 uh, square feet. The um, 
the two bedroom, two story is 600 square feet and the three bedroom, two story is 800 square feet. So it's almost, I mean, it's tiny, but it's almost not tiny. If I could speak just quickly to the Hamilton experience. Um, so Hamilton, uh, the way the, the, the zoning works in Hamilton, which is what I'm more familiar with, is they, they just refer to it as a secondary dwelling unit, whether it's detached or part of a principal dwelling. And really the main thing is that it's a separate self-contained dwelling unit and it's accessory to a principal residence. Um, there's obviously parameters which would restrict the size of them, but you can have it as small as you want, subject to building code requirements, of course, um, and you just can't exceed the max, which is typically 75 square meters or approximately 800 square feet. But... Okay. Um, I can say from a utility perspective, while we have no, no issue with size, it needs to not be like the ones on HGTV. It needs to be a permanent structure because it needs to be connected to utilities. So, yeah. <laughs> Can I right. chirp in? I, I think that was, absolutely. So this oh, is uh, Marie. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm like, um, I'm calling you from Arizona too, so I'm from a different climate zone. Um, I think tiny home is a, is a scarcity concept that needs help. Um, and yet we have to hitch on to the, um, the, the popularity and the concept that is shared. Um, here in Arizona, we have a range of, of you know ADUs, junior ADUs, and I think if you could define a range of these things, um, the point where whether or not it's hooked up to utilities is a great point. I went to a tiny home village, you know, showcase here, and there was a gentleman saying, you know what, if you're under 200 square feet here, I don't know if this works this way in Canada, um, but if you're under 200 square feet, you don't have to hook it up to utilities, but they can wire it as if it's a motorhome. And, um, but for ourselves with COVID and our family, where I'm suddenly in the sandwich where I have to take care of older people and um, my youngsters that cannot find a place to live, um, we need a functional definition of what we're really looking for that is small. So the tiny house inherently as a tiny house is, is not automatically efficient at all. But if you need a she shed, a accessory dwelling unit, a junior accessory dwelling unit that does not need the kitchen and bathroom, I think laying out those levels um, to take advantage of what is advantageously small. And at the same time, what's exciting when I hear about the alleyways is that if you can do them, as, as someone was mentioning, at scale to do like three or four at a time, um, then it's not me finding something like, um, I think Dennis Mashad, there's people that are like, I can build my own house. And if that's accessible, that's nice, but it's even more accessible if somebody else can do it or do three or five of them. And then I can develop a little tiny town on my condemned alley among my neighbors. And then you can start to harvest um, like geothermal or other energy opportunities that get really efficient at like the small small neighborhood scale anyway so that's my that's my piece of um uh, interest oh and then this um i don't know if you've seen co everything and oby in california if you if you google co everything they have all kinds of great numbers and hats off to the math ladies that was so impressive you know staring down the math it was just so inspiring um but they're cutting a lot of um housing deficits and what they would do is they just go to people, and it's only in the Bay Area because they're small. Um, they say, I'll give you $500 a month if you let us use the back end of your single family lot. And they go and develop it and property manage it. Um, I don't know how they're doing, but it was a neat idea. Sure. And, and, and I think uh, Stephanie's presentation really speaks to that, that there are, it, uh, it doesn't work with the same financial approach that we use for single family dwellings. Um, right. It needs to, you need to sort of, uh, you know, try out different methods of uh, funding for sure. Um, thank you, Marie, for your uh, comments and questions. Uh, what we're going to, I have a question uh, for Brody, um, specifically about um, uh, in Hamilton, uh, I, I was not aware until today that Hamilton was the first city to adopt this um, additional or accessory dwelling unit. And I'm wondering if there are any 
um, policy insights um, that you could share with us that many of our attendees are people who work in municipal governments and in planning uh, departments and in uh, planning companies. Um, and I'm wondering if there's anything you could share with us about how to, you know, what policies, first of all, would encourage this, um, make it easier to manage. Um, and two, if there's anything uh, that any policy you wish you could see implemented, what would that be? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I'm not too involved in the policy side of things. I'm more in the implementation of the already in place rules and regulations. So I, I can't really speak to that. I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss uh, misstep myself here. Like, uh, but um, yeah. So unfortunately, I can't really answer your question too good. Um, maybe maybe uh, Kent or, or Dave, in your experience in Hamilton, maybe you could actually speak to in terms of something in your in your personal experience as well. Um, what have you guys found? Ken, why don't you take this one? Yeah. What's that? Sorry, my uh, my internet was kind of breaking up there. That's okay. So, uh, like, my question really is: um, Is there any uh, planning policies that um, you that a exist already that you would like to see um, implemented more widely, or a policy recommendation um, for that would help? make this process easier? I think Hamilton's doing some things better than Toronto. Um, one being the limiting distance from fire hydrants. Um, they'll be a little more practical in terms of um, the EMS and firefighting side of things, in terms of, you know, hose lengths and how, uh, how you know, how a fire truck, where a fire truck would park and the hose lengths that they have. and Kind of how they would access the um, the ADU, um, so they're a little more progressive in that respect. Um, where they're not so progressive, I would say, is in the maximum size of the. They they have a very specific uh, footprint in terms of how large you can build um, a laneway suite. Anyway, right now I, the garden suite thing right now I know is not really um, there yet, so I can only really speak on the the laneway suite side of things. But um, there is a maximum footprint size, which I think is is small, depending on because I think the way Toronto has built it is there is a maximum of eight meters in width by ten meters in depth. Um, so you have an eighty uh, square meter footprint, basically, so one hundred and sixty meter GFA, essentially, where you can build these things. Where Hamilton is significantly smaller. They just increased it. I think Brody was is it seventy five now? Um, yeah, for GFA, yeah, yeah for GFA. but I mean, so if you have a lot, yeah, and if you have a property that that can that can that can have a have a laneway suite that's larger than that, I don't really necessarily see why you wouldn't be able to to build it larger. Um, they also have a lot of regulations in terms of setbacks from the property line. Where at Toronto, you can build right to the property line, uh, left and right. Whereas in Hamilton, you need a minimum setback. I think it's one one point, uh, or it's about four feet from each um, from each property line right now. So you need a clear shot all the way through from the, from your street all the way back to the alley. Whereas in Toronto, you can, you can actually build directly like right onto the property line. So um, I guess there's good and bad. Um, what I would like to see is just a little a little more the the the, the the bylaw I'd like to see a little more relaxed and maybe more co coherent with Toronto because um, they're they're very very different in how they're approaching um, what they're approving right now as of right. So I'd like to see Toronto and Hamilton work together maybe a little bit more. Probably not going to happen, but um, but I, yeah, I think Hamilton can maybe loosen up a little bit. But the the other thing with Hamilton is they haven't seen the the permitting come through as quickly as Toronto. I think there's currently about 180 permits for laneway suites in Toronto with the city right now. I think they've approved almost 100 already. Um, and that's only just been basically within the last, you know, 20 months or so. So, you know, when you look at somewhere like Vancouver, where, where they've been doing um, ADUs and laneway suites for the past, you know, 11 years or so. And I think they've got, Dave, you might know this number better than I, but I think they've built, you know, a thousand of them and i think at any one time they have a couple hundred permits in the city so it, it's a it's it's progressing 
Um, but Hamilton will will change as 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 more permits are are issued and more permits are are applied for. Um, it's just it's the beginning stages. So yeah, I, I will I will say that's a good point. That um, yeah, I mean you know, the, bottles, the, bottles, the bottles are relatively new. Like the original uh, SDU rules were I think came into force in fact in 2018, but it was limited to a very specific area of Hamilton. Whereas now it applies essentially to the whole of the city, provided you live yeah. in a residential neighborhood. Um, and the one major limiting factor that I'm seeing play out so far with uh, with 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 uh, tenants looking or, or or residents looking to construct these would be uh, the parking requirements that apply across the city in Hamilton. Um, so it's generally speaking, I'm not sure how it how it how it works in Toronto, but in Hamilton, you're typically required unless you live in a very specific area of the city to provide additional additional parking for your SDU. Um, and in most instances, the, the, a lot of instances, you can, the, the lot isn't large enough to accommodate it. So that seems to be one of the big policy changes I could see coming down the road that would uh, that would that would really open the door to more more mm -hmm. of these types of units being constructed you know okay yeah in, in Toronto right now if you actually if you build a laneway suite in Toronto your parking requirements are uh, null and void so if you mm -hmm. had a minimum you know two cars for your lot if you build a laneway suite all parking requirements are are gone so you don't need okay. to have any parking anywhere you need two you need two bike stalls that's it. Uh -huh. So they're yeah, really so they're, pushing. Hey, that's a yeah, they're pushing for uh, not urban sustainability. Then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I see yeah, we're rapidly sure. running out of time. I think we're already actually over. Um, if we can, Miyoko, I just have one other question I'd like to ask you, um, it which is, what benchmarking standards should uh, designers be using um, for this housing type? Great question. Um, I think. For our tiny homes, we chose Net Zero Ready uh, as our performance uh, standard because we wanted to make sure that we were lowering the operating costs uh, for the Y as much as possible. Uh, we could look towards an, an actual true net zero. However, uh, as I showed you, we can't fit enough solar panels on uh, the tiny homes themselves to get them to net zero. So. Um, on top of the cost of the solar panels that have to go on the house, we now have to relocate solar panels onto covered parking, which is even more expensive. So when we look at that overall cost of the project itself, going from a net zero ready to a net zero with the use of solar drastically uh, impacts our overall uh, budget. So um, it's definitely a, a balancing act uh, to look to set those kinds of targets when when we're also very very concerned about about the the budget of the project itself. Yeah, um, that certainly is uh, complicating as well. Um, okay, uh, well I, I think we'll have to stop here. Um, I want to thank you all, uh, Miyoko, Stephanie, Dave, Kent, Brody, Natalie, all of you. Thank you for the, the presentations, the discussion. This has been really, really interesting. We have a lot more questions that have come in, but we just don't have time to answer them. Um, so hopefully we can engage uh, the people who are asking the questions um, in another way. We'll maybe through social media, we can try to um, get everyone connected. Um, Miyoko, if I'm correct, you have another webinar coming up with a different organization. Would you like to plug that? Yes, um, it's with ULI on uh, harmonization, the National Building Code, and the Ontario Building Code, and that's at, uh, on Thursday. Okay, tomorrow. Um, yes. All right, so everybody go find that. Um, that is a really interesting topic also. Um, anyone else have anything they want to plug? Any other <laughs> interesting stuff? Uh, okay. Thank you again, everyone, really, and um, for all of the time you put into this, uh, your time here today, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we hope you will, uh, you got a lot out of today. We will have the recording and the slide decks available to you within 24 hours. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me anytime, Adam Jones at sbcanada.org. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.